Have you ever seen a Tubi movie? Well, if you're familiar with my channel, you probably have. So, have you ever seen a Tubi? <laughs> Babe, shut up. Have you ever seen a Tubi movie? Well, if you're on my channel, you most likely have. But have you ever seen a Tubi movie and wished you could draw it out over the course of six episodes of a terribly written miniseries? Well, do I have a treat for you. <laughs> Hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, Home Skillet Biscuit? Today, we're taking a semi-unfamiliar romp through Tubi miniseries, particularly miniseries that exists within what I like to refer to as the Detroit Tubi movie cinematic universe. If you're familiar with the channel, we've talked a lot about Tubi movies in particular. Have yet to see a check from Tubi, but hey, what can I say? And over time, you start to notice some familiar faces, popular storylines, general confusing sequence of events. And I figured why not dabble into those particular to be esque qualities and consume them in the format of a poorly written, incredibly convoluted six part law and order ripoff called Street Legal. Street Legal is a law drama about a family named the Rogers and they actually have a history, a lineage, if you will, of crime. And they are now defense lawyers that take on cases to defend the innocent. Granted, most of the people they end up defending, we find out within the show, definitely did that <laughs> But I digress because there's a lot of things wrong with this show in particular. Think Law and Order, for those who have never seen Law and Order or met a judge or been in a courtroom or even know how the law even kinda works or has never met a human or read a book <laughs> or watched any cohesive storyline. Street Legal. Like I said, it's a six part mini series. It actually came out last year and it's the first season. I struggle to say hopefully of many. <laughs> I don't, know. we'll see how this video does and maybe if it if it does well enough, yeah, make that second season so I can get mad all over again. But each episode focuses on an individual case and then there's like a through line plot of drama, particularly about the Rogers family, mostly related to how the parents of the Rogers family are currently incarcerated and have been for 10 years on drug RICO charges. So two of the kids of that family, Jordan and Justin have become lawyers and they are both working on their case. Several of the episodes are obviously based off of real cases and they, you know, they don't take much time to hide that. Um, it's kind of like a where's Waldo of unfortunate events. So if you catch any of the crimes that are real, put them down in the comment section below. Let's play a game, a very inappropriate game. I'm sorry. So think of this as essentially anything else you've seen from Tubi, especially the ones that are made in Detroit, but longer. You're welcome. I actually watched it several times over the course of several months, each time thinking I must have missed something, but this last time I was taking notes. It's just very poorly written and incredibly convoluted. So for those of you that like to yell at the TV saying, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. This is a great series for you. <laughs> but for those of you that are just very curious and wanna hear about me talking about it, let's get started on street legal. But first, rest it is down here. First, we have to secure her life of luxury. Okay, she's sniffing my finger, hello. I'm very upset at her because she stole my taco today. <laughs> Literally was minding my own business and I saw her dragging a quesadilla across the floor. Motherhood. But yes, um, I need to pay for her to uh, be out of my sight sometimes at doggy daycare. So let's uh, watch this here ad, thank you. Why hello there, it's Admiral Kinney, and today's video is sponsored by Opera, your new favorite browser for making life simpler and increasing productivity. It's the browser that works with and adapts to your needs to provide more space, intuitive navigation, and smooth interaction. It's fully decked out with a bunch of cool features like Lucid Mode, which sharpens your video quality with just one click, Tab Islands, an intuitive tab navigation system that gives you more space for focused and efficient browsing. You can use it to organize your tabs into groups, and they're collapsible and expandable as you need. This is particularly useful when I'm doing research and organizing clips, content, pages, and that then makes the scripting and organization process that much easier and quicker. There's Aria, which is Opera's native browser AI. And that is particularly helpful when I'm doing scripting because if I have a big topic and I don't even know which direction to go to, Aria gives me some jump off points that I can look into. And it also has a free VPN and app block to make browsing safe and secure. So if you wanna check out Opera, you can check it out using the link down below. Big thanks to Opera for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. 
Like I said before, each episode focuses on an individual case, but there are some patterns that happen throughout all of the episodes. Mainly, you get a case at the end five minutes of the episode, you get what really happened shown on screen. And between the beginning and the end, it's just a whole bunch of bullshit. Again, people that have never watched any legal show, never saw an episode of Legal Eagle. Hi, Dylan. That's not his name. Devin. His name is Devin. Hey, Devin. Legal Eagle. Can you stop chewing on things? She got a brush. All them toys you got. You want to chew on a brush? She's on one today. The first episode is entitled Hold My Gun. It's the first episode and it really prepares you for a Law & Order-esque ripoff. It starts off with the kind of like doom and they do the disclaimer like, we are the lawyers like the that protect that the people them. that didn't actually do the crime, even though most of these episodes showed that the mother definitely did the crime, but whatever. These are their stories. And a disclaimer that any resemblance, oh my God, you scared me. My friend Kyrie is over. <laughs> you wanna say hi? Okay, but each one starts off with a disclaimer that any resemblance to real people is purely coincidental, I'm sure. <laughs> but it opens up with a family, the Rogers family, eating at their family table. They seem to live comfortably in upper class society, upper class suburbia. The kids play sports. They have three kids, Kelly, Jordan, and Justin. But they're a normal family. The boy, Justin, likes sports. They talk vaguely of them working in real estate state and everything is peachy keen until the FBI bust in saying you mother going to jail. Why? They're getting the parents on being <laughs> leaders of a very large drug syndicate of sorts working out of the Detroit auto plants. And of course, as you can probably deduce very early in the show, anything that would be from Tubi kind of has this vibe, but the acting is atrocious. Why don't you tell them the truth? And what exactly would that be? That their father's a drug dealer? That daddy's a monster, probably the biggest drug dealer in all of North America. Go ahead, tell him the truth. I love it. I unironically love to be. I do think watching a show is a bit overkill. It's a lot, but if you've never experienced Tubi, I highly recommend you do. Now we get our first introduction to the intro song. I ain't going down, down with ya. If you're going down, down, get ya someone now. As far as uh, music in a Tubi related work goes, not bad. It was very catchy after like the second episode. So I was hooked. And even when I didn't want to watch a new episode, I was like, but I get to listen to dance. Uh, it's, uh... Loved it. Also, as far as like to be related things go, editing, graphics, film quality throughout the show, not bad. I have a sneaking suspicion as to why that is, and I'll explain that more later as we get there. But they put at least a little bit of money in whatever this is, so God bless. So after the parents are arrested, we push forward 10 years and Justin and Jordan, the brother and the oldest sister, end up becoming lawyers, particularly criminal defense lawyers, while the youngest daughter, Kelly, is now a therapist. And in this episode, we are introduced to the first of the six cases that we will discuss that is in conjunction to the main through line of getting their parents out of jail. This story is about a man, a rapper, particularly a famous local rapper named Hakeem, who is running from police because he had killed the man that his ex-girlfriend was dating because he was abusing their kid, his kid, the kid that he had with the baby mama. Keep up. The baby mama's name is Portia. Being that he's on the run, first thing he wants to do is get him a lawyer. And he goes about this while actively running from the police, like they're right behind him. He runs into the law firm that Jordan and Justin now have together, goes up to her with the murder weapon <laughs> and screams, help me, help me, the police are after me. This the gun I killed the with. <laughs> Please, they coming. Who's coming? Who are you? This the gun I killed the with. He says this as the police barrel down on him. So they were undoubtedly close enough to hear him screaming, yeah, this is the gun I shot the with. But he's able to admit this to Jordan, even though she's not his lawyer yet. I guess she decides to take him on at that moment. And she takes the murder weapon, by the way. The murder weapon that he just admitted was the murder weapon. But she's like, sure, I will help your case and not at all turn in this murder weapon to the police. This is a big case for the law firm, of course, because Hakeem is a big local celebrity and this is gonna get a lot of eyes on their law firm in particular. But because of that, it creates a certain level of scrutiny. So when Justin is asked, are you sure this is a good case for your sister to take? 
He says, if my sister took the case, then I know she did it for a good reason. To you, she just took on the case of somebody actively holding the smoking gun. And beyond that, I think this is where I wanna bring up a reoccurring narrative tool or method this show continues to do, which is basically anytime someone asked, why do you believe this person is innocent? They just say, they don't strike me as the type of person to do that. Literally every defense in this show is 100% based off of nothing but pure vibes, man. Nah, I don't feel it from him. I got a sixth sense. Psychic. I just feel like he didn't do it as the only character vouch needed at any point, at any level of legal defense. So, or narrative structure, so good on ya. Jordan goes to visit Hakeem in jail and he swears that he killed the man because he caught him actively assaulting, essaying his daughter. Prior to this, he had no ill will towards the man even though he was dating his ex, but he saw him attacking his daughter and he snapped and shot him. But Jordan is like, I'm on the case. All you gotta do is tell me everything and I'm here to defend you. Also at this law firm is the assistant Kai. And this is where I'm going to take a quick pivot and talk a bit more about Sarah China Evolt. Sarah China Evolt is an interesting part of Detroit Tubi movie lore. At this point, I've seen several movies with her in it. A few months back, me and my friend Miosha took a Detroit hood movie walk through Tubi and discovered the through line of <laughs> Miss Sarah Evolt, mainly that she had a hair store for a very long time, was very successful off of that, and seems to be in some way or another associated with funding some of the better qualities quality Tubi movies I've seen out of Detroit. Beyond that, probably the thing you noticed first is that she's a Korean woman with a very thick Detroit accent. That ain't nothing much, how you doing today? After a little snooping, me and my friend discovered that she went to Ludington Middle School, which is a very specific, specific Detroit esoteric West Side tidbit of information. But if you know anything about Ludington Middle School, you know that's a black ass school. So I can't say her accent fake per se, but she was adopted by white people and surrounded by black people and she's Korean. She went through a lot. There was a lot to discover there. She don't say in the show, but I wouldn't be surprised if she say it somewhere else in her life. I haven't heard it, so I can't get mad at her yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. But I say all that to say begrudgingly, but also kind of like, huh, that's some weird Detroit Anything that she is involved in, the production value will be upped quite a bit and it's noticeable, like the visual quality. Will the acting be good? Will the storytelling be good? The script, continuity, how it's a story? Absolutely not, but it will be filmed and edited quite well. The visual quality will be halfway decent actually. And I've actually seen one movie that she participates in that is not good at all, but it's good for Tubi. I don't know, I was considering doing like a double, triple feature in regards to Sarah Vault because her movies are particularly interesting in the grand scheme of like terrible Detroit movies. So let me know if that would be something you'd actually be interested in or is that too niche? <laughs> Is that too specific to the area in which I live? But anyway, but her name is Kai in this show and she plays their assistant as well as kind of their rogue henchman of sorts in some situations. Essentially all of the lawyers also moonlight as hard criminals themselves, like hands dirty criminals themselves. So she participates in that, you know, street legal uh, aspects of everything. Which brings me to Jordan keeping the gun. She keeps it, she does not turn it into police. And this just becomes something that Kai and Justin kind of just chat about, chortle about, because you know, she'll always go the distance for her clients even being someone who tampers with evidence, apparently. Go off queen. We love people that really have a lot of passion for their work. But Kai's done some research on Hakeem and according to her, he did too many good things for people in his life. So there's no way that he's a murderer. And this is another thing going back to the, he just not that type of dude defense that they use for most people. They also bring up some shit that has nothing to do with the case. Like he helped his friend that time. He's the only child to two city workers who are still married to this day. This guy could have went anywhere in America, right? But he decided to go to Livingstone because his friends didn't get accepted into Michigan. And they always promised that they would go to college together. So this guy kept his word and went to Livingstone with them. Like, this guy seems like a saint. Couldn't be a murderer. <laughs> he went to Michigan State. He couldn't sell drugs like those two things have nothing to do with each other but in the world of street legal that is a valid defense justin ends up calling their father in jail the father's name is lamont just 
to keep things easier because there's a lot of dads that end up being real insane in this. <laughs> and I ended up getting very confused while writing down notes. I'm like, well, whose dad is that? His name is Lamont. That's their dad, Lamont. And currently Jordan and Justin are working on their parents' appeals. I assume that whoever wrote this show went to the same law school as Tyler Perry, because there's just a lot of things that don't make sense in this movie. Watch my Mia Culpa video. It was only a few weeks ago. And I did look it up. Apparently it's not illegal to represent your family in court. It's just greatly frowned upon for good reason, because there's a lot you can co-conspire on, I would imagine. I don't know. I'm no lawyer. I just watch a lot of Legal Eagle. But they're doing their parents' case. And Justin goes to Lamont, their father, and says, we have information that a witness for your case is going to come to the stands 10 years after you've already been in jail. So I don't know how that works, but his name is Bernard. Do you know this man? And he says, yes, he used to be an employee of ours. He used to like do shipments. Well, Justin is like, Bernard gave your name up for some nefarious shit because they were trying to get off Bernard's son. So he gave up y'all name in a deal to not have his son go to jail. I don't know how that works, but nothing works how they work in real life in this show, so that's fine. Back to Hakeem's story, he pleads not guilty for the murder of the dude that he openly said he shot. <laughs> And after a few moments and a bunch of pointless outbursts in court, the lawyers have reached their quota of he's not that type of guy vibe points to decide that we really need to make sure that this man doesn't go to jail. With that said, Hakeem definitely ends up telling his sister the story of how he definitely shot the that he said he shot, but for some reason is pleading not guilty for. He tells his sister why he shot the man in the most believable acting we've seen all episode. So you had to just kill Portia's man? Come on, bro, stop it. He was kissing her. And you saw that for yourself? Yes, and quit asking me all these questions, damn. And then in comes the ex-girlfriend, Portia, and Hakeem tells her that he got two tickets for her and their daughter to leave the area while this all blows over. They should go. He's going to go into court and change his plea and serve time for some reason that we don't know yet. He says, I'll give money to my mom so that you can have money for our daughter. And Portia seems to be less worried about him going to jail and more so about him rationing money out to her. The lawyers all gather together to share their information that they've garnered about Hakeem and his past, particularly his ex, Portia. And one of the lawyers at the table, Jennifer, says that she knows Portia personally, knows her very well. They used to be best friends, but they fell out after Portia ended up having sex with Jennifer's boyfriend. His nickname was G. Now G was actually Hakeem's best friend. Follow. And G ended up getting shot in mysterious circumstances. After G died, Portia went back to Hakeem or with Hakeem, and that's how the story went. Speak of the devil, here comes Hakeem to admit to Jennifer, Miss Bob, that Hey, I killed him because Portia told me that he tried to SA her, tried to assault her. And I caught them having sex and so I shot him. Now, if you recall, this is now two circumstances in which he has shot a person and asked questions later. Um, <laughs> I don't know how this helps him in the grand like vibe checks, but sure. Now, upon hearing this, Jennifer is like, I know that Portia, she lied about everything. She was definitely not assaulted and neither was her kid. I mean, I guess in canon with the show, that's fine. But it's always a sticky situation to go straight to that. But okay. But Jennifer is like, I know Portia, that is evil. So I believe that she lied about both of these people and ended up getting them both murdered. She lies, uses her feminine wiles to get whatever she wants and then goes about her life. So Portia gets taken in for question by the police, prosecutors, somebody. And they're particularly asking whether or not she hit the murder weapon for her quote, baby daddy. Yes. I think that you hid the murder weapon trying to help your baby daddy. Stereotypical white man that is in every uh, Detroit Tubi show, movie, he's played here as well. He also got a fat <laughs> Not important, but he got a fat <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, he's like, you probably hid the gun. I'm gonna make you an accessory to murder. I don't think that's how that works, but I don't know law. Wouldn't that make her someone to tamper with evidence? Anyway, back at the law firm, they have another lawyer meeting. Jordan there with that lip color, that is gorgeous. And she goes to Kai and she's like, run the bullet from the gun. How, this is a law firm, this ain't CSI. What 
mainframe does guy have in a law office but okay that's definitely how that works that's how all of this works but jennifer bob is like i will get portia to turn herself in i know her personally we have a past you know i have a random unspecified evidence that she was there during the murder do they ever tell us how they know that she was there during the murder no they just keep saying Eventually, Hakeem goes back to jail in order to change his plea. So a little more back information about the lawyers themselves. Jordan actually has a daughter and because she's working so much, she's missing from that daughter's life pretty often. She ends up having Kelly babysit the girl a lot. And so when she comes to pick up her daughter, she ends up telling a lot of information about the case to her sister, who is not a lawyer. And that's definitely not how attorney client privilege works, but cool go off. They're not doing anything else legal as we'll see in this either. So might as well. Again, this could have all been fixed with an episode or two of Legal Eagle, but. But Kelly is like, you spend so much time away, your daughter never sees you, and I just don't want you to put too much work into defending our parents because they did what they did and they paying for it. It would seem that of the siblings, the only child that seems to have accepted that their parents kind of dug their own grave is Kelly. And uh, Jordan and Justin have said, nah, we not doing that, even though probably our parents definitely did whatever they were charged with, we're definitely gonna try to defend them from that as well. Cool. Randomly, Justin ends up at a business dinner with the dude Bernard that is gonna testify against his father. And while that's happening, Bob, Jennifer, goes over Portia's house to question her about the night that her boyfriend was killed. So Jennifer's like, that man really molested your daughter. And she's like, I wouldn't say it if it wasn't true. And Justin is holding a gun up to Bernard saying, whoa, you was really gonna testify against my pop? You were gonna be a witness against my pops? You were gonna rat him out? You gonna snitch on my pops that's already in jail and has been serving 10 years already? <laughs> like, And in that very parallel moment, both Jennifer and Justin shoot the people in front of them. Jennifer does it with a silencer and frames it as soon by just simply texting Hakeem, I'm sorry. And that's enough for that. <laughs> and Justin shoots Bernard because he was gonna rat out his dad. This episode ends with Kai randomly running into the court when they are about to reach a verdict on Hakeem's case. And she says, yo, Portia dead is and then the next thing is just the middle of them talking and Jordan's like, for that reason, we don't know what reason, for that reason, we should throw the case out. And for that reason, your honor, I do feel like this case should be thrown out. And then the prosecutor is like, if the guns match, I will throw it out. And I have no idea what he's talking about. I guess he means the gun that Portia killed herself with and the gun that shot her boyfriend. If those are the same, then they will throw the case out against Hakeem. Conveniently, here comes Kai like, oh, excuse me, I got evidence somehow of that as well. And then they throw the case out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I can't do this for the entirety of the show because we will never finish this video. But to set you up for what the viewing experience is like, how frustrating it is watching Street Legal. Assume that every episode is gonna have some incredibly egregious plot hole. <laughs> What I love about this episode is that the law firm that illegally kept a murder weapon ran tests on said murder weapon out of the law firm and brought those tests in as defense. <laughs> the same weapon that has been missing until they found Portia's fake ass after meeting up with one of the lawyers at said law firm that illegally kept the murder weapon. Yes, yes, that's definitely how this works. Never seen a man more innocent in my life or a law firm, not shady at all, not also participating in, in crime. And that's before we even find out about the murders. <laughs> like, but it ends with Hakeem being a free man with a retelling of what really happened, the events of the night that led to the boyfriend's death. Now, this is another reoccurring part of this show is at the end of each episode, you'll get the what really happened clip. These most times are not actually any more clarifying <laughs> to the rest of the episode. It's just a way to say that's how the, how the show ended. So on to the next case. And this one, the boyfriend found out that Portia was cheating on him, if I remember correctly, and a fight broke out. Just then Hakeem happened to come inside and see them fighting. That distracts the boyfriend enough that Portia is able to get her gun and shoot him. Hakeem decided to take the blame for it for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. And he co-conspired with her to make up a fake story about this man molesting their child as a justification for killing him.
Great guy. Okay. Episode two. This episode is titled Frenemies. And this episode follows a group of friends that take a trip to Cabo. And after a night of drinking and obvious jealousy. Yes, please. You ain't all that. One of the women named Nicole ends up dead. I can only guess what this is in reference to. This isn't discovered until the next day when their one white friend comes in from the airport and notices that she's not taking a nap. She's actually just dead, <laughs> just dead. And they call in the hotel doctor or something and they confirm that she has died. One of the guys from the trip ends up calling Nicole's mother and telling her that she had died. And he initially plans to blame it on her drinking too much alcohol. And then he starts kind of word vomiting and says that another girl there, Autumn, didn't mean to hurt her. At that moment, here comes Autumn. She snatches away the phone. She's like, I'm not taking the blame for all of this shit. You lost your mind. That same guy ends up going to the front desk and this is a very random scene and it never comes up again, but he complains about the hotel because someone died <laughs> and asked for a refund and he didn't even pay for it. So they're like, if you don't give us a bad review, we'll give you the entire $5,000 back in cash. That's how all of this works. <laughs> Anyway, Autumn calls her mother and she tells her about what had happened, that Nicole is dead. Autumn blames it on drinking too much and then that another girl named Deja started fighting Nicole. She says she even has a video of it. And her mom is like, send me that video. I wanna post it so that you can save your own ass cause you have evidence that other people was fighting her and now she wound up dead. So this will help take the heat off of you. So Autumn's mom goes to our lawyers and hires them to defend Autumn. They start off by interviewing Deja and another girl from the trip named Elise. So while that's happening, we gotta go back to mom and dad, right? The through line thing. They are, I guess, up for appeal, I guess is what's happening. And they have three more witnesses that have come out of the woodworks to testify against them. But one of them, Bernard, was found dead burning in a car. So wonder what happened to him. It's not like we just saw him get shot by Justin, the guy's son and the lawyer defending him for this case, Jesus. But it would look bad if more witnesses suddenly disappeared. But being that Bernard is now dead, they're trying to convince his son to testify in court to keep Lamont in jail. Lamont and the mom, I forget what the mom's name is. Janet, her name is Janet. Lamont and Janet, those are the, that's the mom and dad. Then they show this random dude. I think it's the prosecutor of the son that got arrested, right? Because that's how Bernard died. It's Bernard Bernard's son. Bernard died because he was trying to protect his son and then he got shot and now they're trying to talk to the son. But now he might have charges against him because they found a bunch of drugs in his car. But for some reason, they still keep saying on camera that they have no evidence against him as if the drugs aren't there. I don't... Long story short, they let the son go. That's all you need to know. Back to the Cabo case. They get an autopsy on Nicole's body and it shows that she did not die of alcohol poisoning. She died of being physically injured, punched several times. And so now that this story is getting more heat, some local reporters break into one of the girl's houses. I think one of the girls from the trip, again, they don't introduce people very well. So I think that's her. They break into her house looking to question her about the case, like literally enter her house. And instead of beating ass for breaking and entering, she hides behind the corner like, oh my God. And then calls one of the other guys from the Cabo trip, one with dreads and tells him that the feds are on their way. They coming to you. I feel like the more I explain this show, the more I think both of us, one, me speaking and you listening to this, if you plan to get through it, there's a certain level of just accepting that shit happened on screen for some reason. Like the words for some reason are written down 8 million times as I was taking notes, so. Rest assured. So for some reason, Jennifer, Miss Bob, goes in to talk to one of the girls, Deja, and I don't know if this is like a deposition or something or interrogation, I don't know, but she interviews Deja. And essentially she's like, were you cool with Nicole? And she was like, I, you know, I dealt with her. She owed me money, I owed her money. And it doesn't take much to get her to admit that, quote, Autumn was fighting her too, Elise as well. She didn't even try to keep a story straight. That's so monstrously funny. Meanwhile, one of the other lawyers from the law firm goes to talk to Dredd. In his telling, he blames everything on Deja. Nicole's parents go on the news and say that we believe that all the people there should be charged for the murder of our daughter. They should all be charged in Mexico. In come Nicole's ex-boyfriend who still loved her very much and is offering anything illegal he can do to help the case. He was like, I went to school for hacking and shit. 
Like I can hack whatever you need and that would definitely be admissible in court, but um, sure. Nicole's mom ends up talking with the white boy from the trip and one of the other dudes from the trip and she's getting frustrated because every time she talks to somebody from the trip, they all have different stories about what happened. And she like, y'all going to jail. Then we get what really happened. All the black people hated Nicole because she was always showing off and she also with all they And so all the girls beat her and all the other dudes there either held her down or laughed about it or planned it. They say in passing that the white dude knew it was gonna happen. I don't know how that would hold up in court. Like, I don't know, because he comes the next day. But rest assured, everybody ends up going to jail. <laughs> even the white dude wasn't even there. <laughs> And then at the end, they do like a black screen with updates. And they're like, so-and-so got sentenced to 60 years. And then the white dude only got three. We know why. Hey, I love blaming white supremacy on everything. I think most things are white supremacy's fault. But that wasn't even there. <laughs> like, I don't know. Girl, whatever. Anyway, episode three. Episode three is titled Say No. And it is a story that starts off with two women arguing in a courtroom. One is being sued for attacking the other woman who's on the stand, the redhead girl, with a bottle. Like beating her with a bottle across the head. And the redhead claims that that's what happened and all she did was ask for a picture. So the woman that's the defendant, she's actually a very famous local Tubi actress, <laughs> child star and world renowned Tubi actress. <laughs> so um, she claims that she was doing it in self defense because she, the redhead had asked for a kiss and she got uncomfortable and wouldn't take no for an answer. And so she beat her with a bottle. So our Tubi star is found not guilty. They never explain what evidence they ever have for any conclusion they reach for this <laughs> so just take it and just know that the redhead is very upset about that and even threatens to kill her in the courtroom on the way out i know you ain't just threatening my client in front of me you and your mother client like i said i got something for that bitch i'm gonna kill that hoe very subtle i ain't going down down, down. Wait, wait, if you're going, going down town get you someone now okay one night we end up following up with redhead and she goes up to Tubi star and punches her in the face at the club. And that's apparently the same night that she was found not guilty. And then the next thing you know, Tubi star found dead and two of her friends had also been shot. So of course, being that the person that would be upset or most likely to kill her, considering she said she would do it like 12 hours ago, that is redhead. With that said, they do arrest her while she was given some neck, which is just rude. Could have gave him a minute. So they arrest her and in comes her mother to our law firm asking for them to defend her. And being that one of their lawyers had just defended the Tubi star, that now she is being accused of killing. Interesting choice of law firms. There's no other law firm at all. Okay, but they're the best in this fictitious world, so go for it. Now, despite the defense attorney from yesterday <laughs> being the guy that got his client off, he's still in the conversation with the prosecutor. So the person that was on the other side of the court case, that person's mother, he's like, yeah, your daughter isn't the type of person to kill somebody. But are now charging her with the murder of Mahogany. Nah. Why you say that? You just gotta meet her, man. She ain't that type of woman. Even though I just saw her threaten to kill my client, who is now dead, <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but vibes. The vibes are so strong with this one. <laughs> yeah, whatever. She's just not the type of woman to do that. But yes, with very little thought, very little de deliberation at all. He's like, she just not that type of girl. She wouldn't do it. So I'll take the case. I'll take a pro bono because you don't have enough money to do things. Back to the storyline of mom and dad, Lamont and Janet. So Justin and Jordan go to visit their parents. Jordan is going to the mom and Justin is going to the dad. Justin ends up calling Jordan and was like, did you know that mama was cheating on daddy? New information for us because we don't know how he reached this conclusion, but sure. Mama was cheating on daddy. She's like, oh no, where you hear that from? Not shocked enough for me. But apparently he had found it out from one of their random reports for their case for their parents. And that's how he found out there was an affair happening. Jordan goes to see their mom, Janet, who looks younger than all of them. Weird casting, but it's not the first time I've seen that in a Detroit to be movie related work. And she's like, hey, you know, Justin now knows that you cheated on daddy. And the way she reacts to that is essentially like, why are the men in our family so sensitive? <laughs> Why are the men in our family so sensitive? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, Justin confronts his dad about the affair and suggested 
that the reason that he had Justin kill Bernard is because that was the man that his mama was having an affair with. The Bernard dude, the one that he shot and burned up in the car. Yes. Mind you, he's saying this very loudly in a prison with a police officer right there. <laughs> but cool. <laughs> Nothing else makes sense. So the dad is like, back the f up, I'm still your daddy. The reason I had you kill that man in front of the police officer, kill that nigga was because he was a rat. He was a snitch. I already knew that she cheated on me with him and I forgave her when it happened, but I was mad that he was a snitch more than anything. So that ends that. Redhead pleads not guilty and she's denied bail because they think she's dangerous. And then with absolutely no evidence, the lawyers get together and believe she is covering for someone else. Again, we don't know how they reached this conclusion, but she's covering for someone else. And so now they're like, let's look into who she's covering for. Cause that's the vibes we got. Meanwhile, Justin and Jordan argue because apparently Justin was the only person in their family that didn't know that they mama cheated on their daddy. And he's like, why am I just now finding out? And they were like, I was trying to protect you and they don't explain what the f that means. So in comes the prosecutor for the redhead case. His name is Shannon Spikes and Shannon and Jordan seem to have a history. They look at each other. He's this very attractive, dark-skinned black man, but he never wears shirts that fit and it's very distracting to me. Like I would find you so fine if you just loosened up a little bit from like one to Dominican, as far as how tight your clothes is, it's real close. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but they have a history. They used to date in high school and apparently tried to date again when they were both in law school, but it never worked out. They have a very push and pull relationship, but he's there to talk business. He too believes that Redhead is innocent for some reason, but he's the prosecutor and he's not gonna give up the case. Does he really explain why he feels this way? You know they ain't explain what the f is. He, Basically he said the gun is registered to someone else, so she didn't do it. Is it like an Aeon if it doesn't know you? <laughs> like, is this kind of super celestial weapon that only works with its true owner? Like, what the f Anyway, but they're like, okay, if you think she's innocent, why are you trying to put her in jail? And he's like, what well, is a big case for me? I'm not gonna lose it. I'm just coming here, you know, I really shouldn't even be here. Why are you here <laughs> then? But okay. Redhead gets a visit from her mama and her sister. And if you have watched any of my other videos, namely the He Played Me series, you would recognize the sister as the lead in those movies. And she's very similar in this show as she is in those, which is yelling. She always yelling. She's a hothead in this one too, but she's very upset that her sister is in jail. So she's like, we gotta do something about this and then leaves. But if your lawyer call me to the stand tomorrow, I'm not lying. Then Redhead's boyfriend comes in and they start arguing because she was like, you were cheating on me with the dead Tubi star. And if it weren't for you, we would have never gotten a fight in the first place. Stop fighting over I done told y'all to stop fighting over Y'all gonna learn one day. So he goes up on the witness stand and says, I saw my girlfriend shoot the Tubi actress and kill a dead and then I threw the gun into the Detroit River. And in order to get myself off, I'm gonna go up here and testify against my girlfriend. They said I wouldn't get in trouble if I testified. <sighs> so the real story, the real story, Redhead did go up to the girl and pop her in the face at the club. However, it didn't go past that with her. But the sister was like, she hit you in the head with a bottle. We gotta finish the job. So she shoots her, pow, pow. That's what you get for touching my sister. And now the sister like, why the f did you do that? Oh my God. So she takes the gun, shoots it in the air. And she's like, I'm gonna take the fall for this. Boyfriend, you better tell them that I did it. Tell them that I did it. Cause I'm not letting my sister go to jail for this. Y'all are very loyal to y'all family. I have nowhere near the amount of loyalty to my family. <laughs> that takes the yeah, but okay. And the episode ends with Shannon's buff coming over to Jordan's house saying that he's here to see his daughter. Episode four. Elevator door. This episode centers around a case involving a man who was shot for not holding the elevator door open for somebody in a hotel lobby. Of the stories or the, the miniature cases that they talk about in the show, this one is particularly confusing <laughs> because they add people that do not matter to the grand scheme of the story at all. And I don't, I'm cautious to not cut them out in case there was something I was missing. I doubt it, but now there are witnesses who saw the man get shot in the lobby and it's a few women. The man had been chatting up these women in the hotel lobby when he was attacked. But for some reason, the women have no real eyewitness reports of anything that happened. They can't remember anything. They said it went too fast and they don't remember anything about the assailant. So <sighs> now 
Remember when I said this show does a very bad job of introducing people? I'm gonna have to be referring to people as bald dude. <laughs> and hopefully we're talking about the same one because after a while, I don't know who any of these are. It's just like watching an episode of Love is Blind, all the people blend together. <laughs> like, I don't know who's who. The man who was shot in the hotel was a dude's nephew. The uncle of the man who was shot is actually in the hotel waiting to do a drug drop off with him. And he ends up finding out that his nephew's been killed in the lobby and it's too late for him to leave because the police are at his door. Somehow they knew he had something like it was a drug related thing. It's been five minutes. I don't know where they got a warrant or this information, but sure. So they go to this room and he's like, I know you selling drugs. Someone got shot in this building and you selling drugs. So it's definitely your fault. They confiscate his gun and send his ass to jail. We fast forward three months and we find out that bald dude is now cellmates with Lamont, the dad. Small world. Justin, meanwhile, is taking on a new defense case. The man who was charged for murdering the dude in the lobby. Follow me. The man who was arrested said that his prince was on the gun, but it's not his gun. He just found it in his car. He got pulled over and they said, oh, you got the murder weapon. So you obviously did it. And now I'm arrested, but I did not do it. Meanwhile, Jordan is back to f her baby daddy. And now they go back and forth, whether or not it was a mistake, whether or not breaking up initially was a mistake. He gets upset because she never told him about his child. And now you decide after like seven years, you wanna come and take care of the kid. He's like, yeah, I wanna take care of my kid now. Also, here's a ring, will you marry me? No, you don't even know this what? Justin, back with the accused shooter, is in court and he is being charged with possession of an unregistered firearm and the murder of the dude in the hotel. He claims, again, that the gun isn't his and gets out on bail as they prepare for trial. They have another one of them lawyer meetings, as they do, and they talk about how the guy that got shot in the hotel was a drug trafficker and they try to figure out what the connection is there. Now, right here is where things get very confusing because they introduce the women who talked to the guy before he got shot, right? And apparently that same night, they had shot a dude in the parking lot who had tried to attack one of the girls. And that girl is the girlfriend of the dude that they're charging for murder of the dude that is in the lobby, that died in the lobby. After they kill him, they try to call the dude and instead of him answering, his boss answers and threatens to kill her. Just keep listening. I Okay, so remember the third child, Kelly? There's Justin Jordan Kelly. Again, she's a therapist and she is giving a session to a woman. I don't know who this woman is. She don't ever come up again, I don't think. If anything, wasn't she the girl that got shot in the last episode? Is she playing a different role? I don't know who this person is, but this is completely inconsequential because we never see this woman again, but I have to, <laughs> I have to tell you about this scene because it's very funny. It's her last session with Kelly, the therapist, and she's like, Maybe we should touch on that very important trauma that you have on the last day you have with me as your therapist, which is the murderous rage she feels that her mother died of an overdose. And now she wants to murder the that sold her hair and she's very subtle about it. I want revenge. I want the people that sold my mom heroin killed. I want them to die. Side note, Kelly is a terrible therapist. Her like, along with not knowing a lot about lawyering they certainly didn't read sh about therapy either because all she said was don't be depressed don't let your anger turn to depression like what type of skill is that <laughs> like you ain't say sh hello dbt give her some tools but the session ends with this lady saying that she's gonna hold those accountable who resulted in her mom's death and apparently the guy that resulted in her mom's death is boss man Again, this is the worst writing any of the episodes ever did. I'm telling you, man, this one's a gauntlet. Okay, so the man that's on trial, right, for murdering the guy in the elevator. Right before trial, some new information that is completely unexplained, again, enters into evidence. This time it's from a dude that Justin is friends with. And he's like, the guy on trial can't go to jail, he's family. And then the next thing you know, he and that like, your honor, I feel like with this unspecified evidence, we should drop all the charges again. Also during trial, the prosecutor is like, we don't have the murder weapon or specifically we couldn't find it. There is no log of it anywhere in the system. And because there is no weapon, they just let them go. <laughs> we have no idea who stole the weapon. We have no idea <laughs> what happened to the weapon. How this stops you from charging him with murder considering there are some other 
This is dumb. Anyway, <laughs> the real story of that night, the boss hired Baldy and another dude who I'm going to refer to as Mr. Bear to kill the guy in the elevator. Bear does shoot him in the elevator and then hides his gun in the car with baldy and then when he leaves he just leaves it there and he gets pulled over by the police and they charge him i don't know whatever happened to bear i don't even know who bear is <laughs> and he never show up again anyway so what the f so that's the end of the episode we never find out anything about that side story about the girl shooting the dude in the parking lot that one's a mess particularly okay episode five talk too much this starts off with a boy 19 20 year old boy named jason praying in church because he has a lot of problems and once he leaves the church he breaks into a man's home, beats his and steals his phone. When he gets back to his home, his mother finds him looking through the phone and in a tizzy, he leaves and the mom discovers a bunch of sexual photos of her son on this man's phone. This man, apparently Jason's college basketball assistant coach, and he had naked photos of Jason in his phone. Now, being that this does exist within a lot of the stereotypes of Detroit media, of course, we're not gonna be concerned with the power dynamic of your assistant coach having sexual photos of your child. They're much more focused on the fact that he might be gay. <laughs> That is the very focus of every conversation that goes forth from now on is whether or not he's gay. Boy, are you gay? No, I'm not gay. Are you sure? Ma, I said I'm not gay, damn. He's like, I ain't gay. And I'm like, why are we? Who cares if you are? This is not, this should not be the focus of this conversation. So Jason's father goes up to rough up the assistant coach, but when he gets there, already did as well, unfortunately, as his son. Damn. I'm going downtown, witch. I'm going downtown, get you someone now. He goes to the police, talks to them, and they're like, Did you kill your son because he's gay? And he was like, He said he wasn't gay. <laughs> also, no. <laughs> didn't kill my son. But apparently this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is actually the beginning of a very big sex scandal in which they find out that this assistant coach was actually texting every single basketball player pretending to be their girlfriends and he was slowly collecting every person's nudes on his phone. I'm not saying murder is always the answer, but it can be convenient. <laughs> like, like, I mean, hey, sometimes have it coming like i don't know <laughs> like gross and then as usual we do a good old i don't think he's that type of guy so they let the father go <laughs> and in comes his wife and the mother of the deceased son and they let her know that their child has been shot it's not funny because it's heartbreaking if it were better acting but her reaction time is hilariously askew and i love it he's dead what he's dead so again, there seems to be many students that this coach may have been interacting with in a possibly sexual way. Some may have known that it was him, some may not. And the police end up going after one boy in particular when him and his mother were trying to escape the city. They go in and find the murder weapon in their home. And instead of arresting the student, they arrest the mom for some reason. In her questioning, they also have a hyper focus on the whole, my son ain't gay thing, again, as if that matters. <laughs> at all she's like that weird ass coach was pretending to be my son's partner and the boy explains that the coach was being a weirdo and pretending to be my girlfriend and i was sending pictures to her for over a year and again he was doing this with virtually all the players and he had been slowly collecting all of their photos gross also not exactly the same but it also sounds like another case if you know the case you know anyway meanwhile jordan is still working on the case with their parents she is interviewing her mother's lawyer from the case the original case 10 years ago and she asked why they didn't go to trial because it would seem that this lawyer is saying that they had a bunch of evidence that they could have beaten it so the fact that they just pled out and decided to go to jail for 30 years didn't make a lot of sense to her back to the basketball case and the mom is still and holding because she has a long rap sheet. That doesn't mean she killed anybody, but that's enough to keep her there, I guess. Sure, whatever. And so the son comes to our law firm asking for defense for his mother, who is now on trial for murder. Apparently the mom was dead.
dating the assistant coach and found out that he was talking to other people and was mad at him because of that. Only later she found out that the quote unquote other people he was messing with, one of which technically included her son because now he has pictures of her son's balls on his phone. So granted the son didn't know he was texting his assistant coach. He thought he was texting a girl. It's a mess. Anyway, that's a reason enough to kill him. Anyway, back to Kelly. Remember Kelly? Well, after four episodes and a lot of other going on, we find out that Kelly's husband knew Bernard. Remember Bernard, the one that Justin shot in the first episode and then lit him on fire? Yes. The one that was going to be a witness against their parents? Yes. The one that their mother cheated with? Follow me. He's like, I actually knew Bernard and Bernard. <laughs> I actually knew Bernard and I was very close to him. I knew that he was supposed to be a witness against your daddy. So I've put together that your daddy has something to do with why he's dead. I really looked up to that random dude, Bernard. Don't know how I knew him, but I really liked him. So I'm upset that your daddy had something to do with that man getting killed. As they start to argue, Justin comes just in time and they're still hot about it. The husband leaves and Kelly is like, did dad have anything to do with Bernard's murder? And Justin is basically like, I would do anything to get mom and dad off of their charges. So your husband, he an outsider anyway, which isn't a direct confession to murder, but close enough. It does the job. Back to the mom of the student, the one that had the murder weapon from the coach and was apparently dating him as well. She said that she didn't know her son's photos were on the man's phone until later. She just knew that he was cheating on her. So called up Jason, the son that got shot in the beginning of the episode and threatened him saying that she would release his nudes if he didn't stop talking to her man. Okay. Well, even if she not guilty of murder, she's certainly guilty of several other crimes. No, <laughs> at least one, but right. She's not the type. <laughs> She wouldn't do it. We gotta get her off for murder though. All right, randomly into the law firm comes another student that also hated the coach because they all did. And he's like, I'm here to help out the mama because though she was a very big advocate for revenge, she's no murderer. So I, so I'm gonna defend her. He's very cute by the way. He just needs some facial hair. Just needs to like, very cute. This dude is like low key. Every player wanted that bit. So it could be any of us. Randomly, Justin and Jordan bring the mom and dad. So Lamont and Janet to see each other. I don't know how that works considering they're both in jail, but cool, whatever. But the mom is like, you killed Bernard. I don't know how she found out, whatever. And Lamont is like, he was going to testify against us. And she's like, no, nah, it would have just been against you. You was already dealing with the feds. I don't know how she found that out, but we just need a fight. You a Rat. And for some reason, this is particularly egregious to Lamont because he's okay with you cheating on him, but calling him a rat has crossed the line. He said, the reason why I pled out for both of us is because they were going to get your daddy for drug charges. New to us. They just be adding sh <laughs> like, okay. But the sheer fact that you didn't give me the benefit of the doubt based off of some information that I did not tell you, I'm mad at you and I want a divorce. As if things couldn't get a little bit more dramatic, Shannon, AKA Jordan's baby daddy, that nobody knows is her baby daddy, comes in and he's like, just so you know, I'm gonna represent the prosecution against your grandfather. Cause now they're gonna try to get him in jail. Yeah, sure. Back to the coach trial. The mom is on the stand and she's like, I didn't kill him, nor did my son. And then the one dude that was kind of cute saying like everybody wanted to kill his he get up on the stand and then they end up asking him, well, did you, did you kill him? And he's like, I played the fifth. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> what the f Why did you come out of the woodworks to get on trial? And you know, you had something to do with the murder. <laughs> okay. They also don't pursue anything with him, even though that was suspicious as f And they find the mama innocent. And the reason why, according to the jury, we just didn't feel like she was the type of person to <laughs> Next, we show a newcomer to the story, a newcomer to the family. This is the grandfather. This is Janet's father who is getting arrested for charges from 15 years ago, which is murder. So Lamont is saying that he took a plea deal because they were going to get his wife, Janet's father for charges. But if he pled out, I don't know what, I don't know how that had anything to do with it, but sure, none of this makes sense. Back to the real story of what happened with the coach. After it was found out that he was being a f 
creeper a bunch of the players like five of the players went over his house with a gun that had one bullet in it and they were going to do russian roulette to see which one of them gets the honor of killing the assistant coach who was being a creeper it goes to each of them and they each don't have it until it gets to jason and when it's his turn odds are he's probably going to be the one with the bullet it actually it's pretty much 100 percent sure he's the one with the bullet and he can't do it so they get mad at him and one of them end up shooting the assistant coach and because jason was too much of a punk to do it they shoot him too episode six this episode is called i got us and this is when we start going more into the granddad's trial he's being interrogated for murder 15 some odd years ago and the prosecutor again is jordan's baby daddy shannon keep up he goes in there and tells the police hey this granddad this old mother he guilty as hell and they were like he don't even look like the type of and he was like, nah, don't let the old man thing fool you. That man is a monster. He's a murderer. He definitely that type of And we know that he's that type of because he ends up punching a man who kept asking him very aggressively, what is his name in the jail cell? So, you know, he a bad ass motherfucker. If you go downtown, get your someone now. So now, again, we have nondescript, nonspecific new evidence, and they are trying to make a new trial with mom and dad. Also, Justin is like, granddad didn't kill that man that they saying he killed 15 years ago. They were best friends, and he was crushed when he was murdered. But now, the dude that died, his wife, well, his widow, believes that granddad has something to do with it. Jordan goes to Justin, and she's like, can I please take specifically granddad's case? Because I need to go against Shannon because we have a lot of bad blood. Did you know, by the way, that he's my baby daddy? Apparently nobody knew who the child's father was. So this is a big revelation to everybody. He's like, what? She's like, yeah, I need this. I need to go against him. So she represents grandpa. He pleads not guilty. And her defense for why he should be considered innocent and allowed bail is because he helps basketball players in the community. <laughs> he helps students. He's a philanthropist. To lock this man up is insane. Mr. Cunningham is a retired grandfather. He has personally helped hundreds of basketball players. He paid for books, helped with tuition. I mean, to lock this man up would just be insane. <laughs> Because again, that has anything to do with murder at all, but okay. So he ends up leaving on bail. And as the court date ends, she ends up seeing Shannon and he takes this as the perfect opportunity to be like, I know we going against each other in court right now, but just so you know, even though I'm trying to put your granddaddy in jail, I still want see ya. I still want see ya. And I want my daughter, our daughter in my life. Again, meanwhile, the police are very confident that granddad is the murderer. But they also admit to having no evidence no murder weapon or motive. Again, just going purely off of vibes. <laughs> but they arrest his ass anyway, because vibes, that's how things work. They interview the dead man's widow. And now, even though they just said that she thought that granddad killed him, now she's saying, everybody's saying that, but I don't know who killed my husband. Honestly, I don't think it was granddad. She says that her husband and granddad were in the loan shark business and they would loan money to high school athletes to help them go to school for college. And in exchange, they would do some weird shady sh with colleges to convince those students to go to those colleges. So shady, absolutely, but murderer. Nah, the vibes, the vibes are, again. But Justin is working on mom and dad's case and dad is still mad that mom had any inkling that he was a rat. I ain't no rat and that's why I'm getting a divorce. And again, Justin's like, that's based off of information you didn't tell her. And he was like, I'm gonna I want a divorce. I was cool with her cheating on me, but thinking I'm a rat is insane. Meanwhile, Shannon's buff goes to this white woman's office. I don't know who she is. She shows up periodically. They never say what she does. She may be the prosecutor cuter's office i don't know the police office whatever but he goes in there and he talks to her and is like i don't think granddad did it all of a sudden <laughs> he finds suddenly a bunch of evidence again non-specific nondescript that the feds have found that they held on to for 15 years from the original case or the original investigation i should say and he now he thinks that he didn't do it so instead they want to interview the dead guy's son while this is happening kelly is still arguing with her husband and the arguments seem to get more and more heated that it actually turns violent the husband is like that's why i turned your father into the feds because i knew he had something to do with bernard's murder the dude that got burned up now considering you suspect your wife to have murderers in her family that is incredibly intelligent to hit her but hey, nothing else makes sense in this story, so why not? 
at the case for the parents, mom and dad. It comes up that Kelly's husband received a letter from Bernard before he died that if anything happened to him, it was Lamont's fault, the father's fault. And it comes up that Justin was the last person to see this man before he died. Justin, Lamont's son and his attorney. <laughs> She's accusing the attorney <laughs> of murder of the trial that he is currently defending against. That's of course how all of this works. Absolutely. That's how all of this works. Why is Justin not arrested? Why are we even doing this trial? This is so f dumb. So mom, Janet is like, I would like a new lawyer. I think that's the least we can do. And begin a new trial with new information and new evidence, whatever. Meanwhile, Kelly's still arguing with her husband and he threatens to hit her again. And so she shoots him in the stomach. He don't die, but obviously he's not a fan of it. And so he goes to the hospital and in comes Kai and she's been sent by the law firm to handle business. And she goes in there and she was like, I will shoot and kill you. If you tell anybody who shot you, if you keep talking to the feds, I'm gonna kill your ass because I know where you are. I know where your mama is and your side But she don't even take a chance. She ends up poisoning him and he dies. Um, he dies. <laughs> Dead and gone, dead and deceased. They have random people to speak against, testify against granddad, but each of them have some blaring character issue in regards to their testimony. And so granddad takes the stand. He says he didn't murder him. And he thinks instead that one of the colleges they were doing loan shark with hired <laughs> hired someone to kill him because he never delivered on his investment of predating on high school students going to college. And that makes him look good enough because guess what? Guess who don't go to jail for murder? <laughs> granddad because the vibes impeccable but with that said just because there's only like five minutes left in the episode doesn't mean we can't add more random shit. because the final little piece of tea before we get what really happened the real story we find out that shannon jordan's baby daddy is already married yeah the real story the dude from 15 years ago threatened to kill granddad because he was sleeping with his wife which granddad denied but when lamont so dad came in the dude was sh distracted enough that granddad shot him and before he died he was like tell me the truth did you f my wife and he was like i'm in love with her and then he shoots him twice more so yeah when he was found not guilty <laughs> Hey, that's what lawyers do, but my God. The episode ends with Jordan going up to Shannon. He's like, oh, okay. So you want me to forgive you for everything? You want me even trying to put my grandfather in jail? You want us to start over? Well, there's some things you are gonna have to answer for. And in comes his wife and she's like, we need to talk. And that's how the episode ends. Hi, Bubba. She was asking for uppies. So that's the end of the show. <laughs> convoluted <laughs> mess. I made it somewhat digestible, which truly, pat myself in the back, it's a feat. It's an absolute convoluted mess, but I'm not gonna lie, I'm kinda, I do kinda wanna know what happens. I don't know if I want the show to continue or do I just wanna act like this didn't happen? I, I still haven't fully decided, but again, maybe it depends on how well this video does will be the answer to that. But yeah, I hope you like this video. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which I can do today. Compliment my hair. I did it myself. They're not even at all, because I couldn't see the back of my head, but it, it works because when I was a kid, I never got beads. Ow. So it really uh, heals my inner child. Oh, be sure to watch me on Connect the Dots, where we interview people that are much more interesting and more famous than I. <laughs> and I will see you guys next time. Bye. Say bye.